Hey, everybody, it's Mike from the Mike Wagner Show, powered by SonicWeb Studios. Visit online at SonicWebStudios.com for all your needs. Look at a professional website without breaking your budget. SonicWeb Studios is the answer. SonicWeb Studios offers fast, affordable custom web designs that blow the competition away. Call today, 1-800-303-3960. That's 1-800-303-3960. Or email to support at SonicWebStudios.com. Mention Mike Wagner Show, get 20% off your first project. Sonic Web Studios, take your image to the next level. Also, time to give official shout out to our official sponsor of the Mike Widener Show, international war ring author Mia Molson Zia. If you love fast paced mysteries, you'll love Missing by Mia Molson Zia, available on Amazon and paperback and ebook. Missing is fast paced and intriguing with an unforgettable twist. It takes place in four countries, two strangers, one target, where truth is illusion and those you love will be the first go missing. It's available on Amazon and paperback and ebook. Missing by Mia Molson Z has garnered great reviews and Eve Levin endorsed by Howard Celebrities, including Joanna Cassie, Forge Riley, and Manimus. So grab your copy today, Four Goals Missing by Mia Molson Z, available on Amazon. Also, check out the Mike Widener Show at the themikewidenershow.com on over 40 podcast platforms heard in over 100 countries, including Facebook, SoundCloud, Spreaker, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. Also, Anchor FM, iTunes, Google Play, Amazon, Audible, and Apple Music, as well as HamiltonRadio.net, Oldies FM, Diamonds Radio, and a few of their uh, networks coming near you. Take the Mike Widener Show with you on any mobile device. Subscribe to the Mike Widener Show on the YouTube channel. Follow the Mike Widener Show on Instagram and Twitter today. And for great gift ideas, go to Amazon.com and check out the Mike Widener Show podcast. T-shirts, pop sockets, throw pillows, hoodies, and tote bags, and uh, baseball gear as well, 24-7. Makes great gifts for your families and loved ones. Go to Amazon.com and check out the Mike Widener Show podcast. And for more great gift ideas, go to Amazon.com slash Mia Molson Zia for great books like Missing, Once, and Wrinkles, for seizures, pop sockets, hoodies, phone cases, and more. Amazon.com slash Mia Molson Zia. Check it out today. I'll support the Mike Widener Show on Anchor FM, PayPal, the Mike Widener Show.com. You can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com at the Mike Widener Show. Make sure you do so today. We're here with a terrific lady who is a lawyer in the U.S. and a solicitor in England and Wales, represented um, inmates on death row, undocumented immigrants, also uh, victims of a domestic and elder abuse, and also uh, does pro bono work as executive director of uh, and chairman of the board of the MAIP, which is the Mid-Atlantic uh, Innocence Project. And uh, she's also she also has a new book out, which was inspired by the uh, Nez uh, Pierce War of 1877. And... Um, it's also, like you said, it's a new new purse war. You should correct that. A gigantic a blunder and also um, a crime that was told uh, through uh, multiple uh, fictional um, perspectives as well, too. And this was inspired by a visit 20 plus years ago after visiting Big Hole Battlefield in Wisdom, Montana. We'll talk about that. Live, ladies and gentlemen, from the Plus Studios in beautiful downtown Montana, somewhere along those uh, wonderful hills in God's country. Ladies and gentlemen, the author of the book, Bone necklace, ladies and gentlemen, the multi talented Julia Sullivan. Julia, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thanks for joining us today. Hi, Mike. Thanks for inviting me. I'm glad to be here. Well, it's great to have you on board as well, too. You've got a great story to tell. You're a lawyer in the U.S. and a solicitor in England and Wales. You represented uh, inmates on death row, undocumented immigrants, and victims of domestic and elder abuse. You also do pro bono work as executive director and chairman of the board of the Mid Atlantic uh, Innocence Project. And you also have a book out which uh, talks about um, inspired by the Inez Purse War of 1877, which was a gigantic blunder. And also you're inspired by that visit 20 plus years ago after visiting Big Hole Battlefield in Wisdom, Montana. It's called Bone Necklace. And before we talk about the book, tell us how I first got started, Julie. How the book got started? Well, I have a home in Montana and about 20 years ago, I made my first visit to the Big Hole Battlefield, which is in Wisdom, Montana. It's a couple hour drive from my house. And I just was fascinated by the story of the Nez Perce. After visiting the Big Hole Battlefield, it's a really stunningly beautiful place where um, one of the bloodiest battles of the war was fought. But I learned um, during that visit many things. Um, uh, but there were several aspects of the story that really intrigued me. Uh, one was the fact that it was kind of a David and Goliath fight, um, which featured the rise of an unexpected Native American leader uh, whose performance was truly extraordinary throughout the war. Um, 
Uh, and the second thing that really fascinated me was that this uh, war had a very unexpected ending. When you uh, read a story about Native Americans going up against the US Army in the 19th century, you think you know how it's going to end uh, with either the destruction or the uh, capitulation of the Native Americans and their confinement on a reservation. And uh, while that was one aspect of the story for some of the Nez Perce, um, about 40% of the tribe escaped to Canada where they received political asylum. Um, I had not been aware that Canada was granting Native Americans political asylum. Mm. Um, and I found that aspect of the story really interesting and fascinating. So anyway, I started, I kind of got obsessed with the story, truth be told. I got home to Washington and this was in the days before Google and before uh before amazon.com and so the way you researched things back then was to go to the national archives or the library i of remember congress. those days yeah the library catalog <laughs> the library of congress the dewey decimal system i remember those days yes <laughs> exactly exactly so i spent about two months in the uh, microfish room at the national archives collecting documents and um i just really got fascinated by the story and i um, put it aside and picked it up and put it aside and picked it up over a period of 22 years. And, and I finally finished it. Um, so I was thrilled. The book got released on uh, June 3rd, uh, last Friday. Um, so here we are. That is so fascinating. And what was at one exact point in that moment when you were doing your research, simply influenced you into writing that book. What was that one moment that simply said during your visit to our West, to the big hole battlefield wisdom on town? What was that one precise moment that you're at that simply said, this is what I'm going to do? I think it was when I was um, walking through the battlefield itself. If you've ever been to the um, big hole battlefield, it's actually, actually part of a national park currently and there's a visitor center there with a museum and a film and they're great uh, but you can also take about a one and a half mile hike through the battlefield and um, there was a warrior who was um, who fought at the battle of the big hole and his name was yellow wolf and Yellow Wolf met a historian named Lucullus McWhorter uh, around the time of World War I. And they struck up a great friendship. And among other things, um, Yellow Wolf and Dr. McWhorter went back to the Big Hole Battlefield and they marked out where everything happened. And they erected, the National Park Service has now erected teepee poles which show where all the families were camped when the conflict began. And because of that, you can really picture exactly what happened. And um, it's really, like I said, it's a stunningly beautiful place along the river surrounded by bluffs and this great big, huge Montana sky and um, I've never been a particularly religious person, but I do consider myself a spiritual person. And I felt an incredible connection to that place. Like I could almost feel what had happened there, uh, what the people had experienced. And I just, I just, honestly, I never could let the story go after that. I, I just wanted to know more. And the more I learned the deeper I was drawn in, I, um, one of the other things that really drew me to this story is that mo many of the people who were involved in it wrote books about it. Yellow Wolf, um, along with Dr. McWhorter, wrote a book called Yellow Wolf's Own Story. Um, Chief Joseph wrote um, an article that was published in the um, North American Review. 
uh, all of the generals who were involved in the conflict wrote books about it because it was such an amazing conflict. So there was a great wealth of firsthand accounts, which took me by surprise for something that happened that long ago. And, and while many accounts of history from that period of time are told from um, the American uh, or US military perspective, in this case, we had many firsthand accounts from the Nez Perce participants as well. So, so you could really see what happened from both points of view. And I, I really liked that as well. Mm -hmm. And that's also first we ever heard about the Nez Perce um, tribe and everything else. You hear about these stories about uh, Little Big Horn and also um, Sitting Bull and everything else among the famous wars as well, too. And, of course, the Nez Perce, uh, you know, tell us about the conflict. And uh, what was that conflict about? And why were the Nez Perce uh, targeted? The Nez Perce were actually great friends of the Americans, Um they formed a particular bond with Lewis and Clark back in 1805 when Lewis and Clark traveled through Nez Perce country on their expedition from St. Louis to the uh, West Coast. Um, in fact, it's according to Nez Perce tradition, um, William Clark had a child with a Nez Perce woman. Oh, amazing. Who was, um, who was captured at the end of the war in the Bear Paw battlefield in Montana, um, but they were great friends with the Americans. What happened is that in 1860, gold was discovered on Nez Perce land. And so of course, once word got out, um, their, their land was overrun with white prospectors and miners and settlers. And for 17 years, the Nez Perce lived peacefully with the settlers. They did not try to evict them. They didn't attack them. They um, engaged in trade with them. Actually, the Nez Perce were quite well integrated with what I'll call white society. They could read and write in English and in their own language. They had a printing press, which they used to print hymnals, huh. uh, Christian hymnals in their own language. They were stockmen. They traded horses for whatever they wanted to buy in the settlements. Um, they wore buckskin, but they also wore calico and flannel. Um, they were well armed with long range rifles. Um, so they were very well integrated, but, but the, the basic problem was that these settlers passed a law. Of course, they created their own government on Nez Perce land and their government create, passed a law that said no Indian could testify against a white man in any case. Really? And this is like their own, their own form of government and it had nothing to do with the actual U.S. government? Correct. It's a local law. Um, and it was, uh, it, it, these were basically trespassers, squatters on Nez Perce land. They formed their government. They passed their own laws. Of course, the Nez Perce had no representation in this government. And uh, they passed this law that said Indians and Negroes could not testify against white people. And so what would happen would be that white people would commit crimes against Nez Perce and there would be no prosecution. And this went on for 17 years. And so in 1877, Chief Joseph uh, went to the military commander with a list of 12 white murderers people who had murdered Nez Perce and had not been prosecuted because there were no white witnesses and no white witnesses who would testify. Um, and Chief Joseph said that, he, that they wanted these 12 white men prosecuted. And if the government couldn't do that, uh, they wanted these 12 white men turned over to the Nez Perce for punishment. Mm. And, um, the military commander, frankly, was powerless because the law was the law and these men couldn't be prosecuted under the law because there were no white witnesses. And that really was what created the conflict. Instead of prosecuting these 12 white men, General Howard ordered the Nez Perce to a small reservation in Idaho, uh, demanded that they give up almost all of their land and move to a reservation in Idaho. The chiefs actually agreed 
because they didn't want to fight with the army. But one young man whose father had been murdered by one of those 12 white murderers um, decided to pursue vigilante justice. And he and a group of his friends went out searching for his father's murderer. And by the end of the night, um, 17 white people were dead, including a woman and a child. Wow. The only uh, atrocities committed by the Nez Perce in the war were committed that night by that man. And although the chiefs tried to turn him over for punishment to the whites, by then it was too late. Uh, particularly once a woman and a child had lost their lives, um, confinement by force to a reservation was the only outcome the public would accept. Mm -hmm. So that... That's how the war began. Um, okay. I, I, I still believe that if the law had treated the Native Americans equally, there would have been no war. Mm -hmm. now, now, on the move to Idaho, where they settled in, um, what, what was it the same they had over there, like with the gold, all the resources and everything like that? What Was it the same conditions that they experienced or was it something better? Was it the same, the worse and everything like that? And, and, and if so, what, what prompted him to um, you know, either stay there or uh, move to Canada? Well, um, confinement to a reservation um, meant many things for Native Americans. For starters, a uh, fighting age man could not leave the reservation. Well, no Native American could leave the reservation without the Indian agent's written permission. And um, a fighting age man could not get permission under any circumstances. So it was, it was um, essentially a denial of any right to travel and uh, the inability to hunt outside the reservation where the herds were, the inability to fish outside the reservation, uh, which is where the Nez Perce got most of their food. So that was part of it. Um, it was uh, confiscation of their horses because horses were viewed as a tool of war. Um, these were stockmen. Horses were everything. Horse, horses were their wealth. Um, it was the inability to choose their own religion. The government chose uh, missionaries for the each reservation and uh, the occupants were required to worship in accordance with the teaching of the missionaries. Uh, it was the inability to choose their own schools for their children. Um, Native American children were forcibly removed from their families and educated in industrial schools, sometimes hundreds or thousands of miles away. Wow. Um, it was... Um, the uh, complete dependence upon the government for subsistence. The policy of the government was to make Native Americans very poor so that they would be dependent upon the government for um, uh, food and clothing. Um, it was allowing the Indian agent to tell them not only what occupations they could or couldn't pursue, but what clothing they could or couldn't wear, and even how they would wear their hair. Wow. It was complete domination by the government. So, um, so yeah, going to a reservation was a big deal. Okay. It was a big deal. Okay, I see where you're coming from. And also some made the uh, escape to Canada. We'll talk about that in just one minute. But first, listen to the Mike Widener Show at themikewidenershow.com, powered by Sonic Web Studios. Visit online at sonicwebstudios.com for all your needs. Look at a professional website without breaking your budget. Sonic Web Studios is the answer. Sonic Web Studios offers fast, affordable custom web designs that blow the competition away. Call today, 1-800-303-3960. That's 1-800-303-3960. Or email to support at sonicwebstudios.com. Mention the Mike Widener Show. Get 20% off your first project. Sonic Web Studios, take your image to the next level. Also, time to give an official shout-out to our official sponsor of the Mike Widener Show, international warring author Mia molson -Zia. If you love fast-paced mysteries, you'll love Missing by Mia molson -Zia. Available on Amazon in paperback and ebook. 
missing is fast paced and intriguing with an unforgettable twist. Takes place in four countries, two strangers, one target, where truth is illusion and those you love will be the first to go missing. It's available on Amazon and paperback and ebook. Missing by Mia Molson Z has garnered great reviews in Eve 11 and George by Howard celebrities, including Joanna Cassidy, Forge Riley, and many others. So grab your copy today for Girls Missing by Mia Molson Zia, available on Amazon. Also, check out the Mike Widener Show at themikewidenershow.com on over 40 podcast platforms in over 100 countries. Take us with you on any mobile device. Subscribe to the Mike Widener Show on the YouTube channel. Follow the Mike Widener Show on Instagram and Twitter today for great gift ideas. Go to amazon.com and check out the Mike Widener Show podcast. And for more great gift ideas, go to amazon.com slash Mia Molson Zia for great books, merchandise, and more. Also support the Mike Widener Show on Anchor FM, PayPal, themikewidenershow.com. You can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com at the Mike Widener Show. Make sure you do so today. We're here with author Julia Sullivan of Bone Necklace here on the Mike Widener Show and giving us uh, an in-depth story about the um, – Nez Perce War and uh, how they lived and everything. And before we talk about, um, you know, flocking to Canada, you also have compassion for people. You're a lawyer in the U.S. and solicitor in England and Wales. And you also represented uh, inmates on death row, undocumented immigrants, victims of a domestic and elder abuse. And about, um, tell us about some of your work, uh, what you do uh, for those people, and especially, you know, have a little bit of ties with um, the Nez Perce as well, too, and their uh, offshoots. Well, as a lawyer, I've always been drawn to stories of injustice. Um, and so that has been a big part of my professional work as a lawyer. Um, I should clarify, I'm the former um, chairman of the board of the Mid-Atlantic Innocence Project. I currently co-chair the um, uh, Mid-Atlantic Innocence Project Alumni Committee, which is uh, former board members. But I do still work with the project. It's, uh, it's an incredible organization that recruits pro bono counsel to represent people who have been wrongfully convicted. Um, there are a number of innocent projects throughout the country. The Mid-Atlantic Innocence Project has been one of the most successful. It has freed 46 people, last time I checked, uh, who were wrongfully convicted, who spent collectively hundreds of years in prison for crimes they didn't commit. Um, so they do amazing work. And um, one of my current initiatives is to help prisoners when they get out of prison. You can imagine you go to jail for crime you didn't commit it takes years and years to get that reversed and when you get out um, sometimes your spouse has divorced you your children don't remember you all of your belongings have been sold to pay for your legal defense you get out with this huge gap on your resume no bank account nowhere to go no driver's license um, so uh, that's part of what we do is try to help people reintegrate with society once they get released but it's a it's a terrific it's a terrific project one thing i learned as a lawyer is that there's a huge difference between the justice that's available to wealthy people and big corporations and the justice that's available to an individual uh, who is um who who against whom the full weight of the government has come crashing down. Um, so I, I feel great compassion and, and have always considered it part of my obligation as a lawyer to help those people who can't afford the kind of defense that, you know, the, the rich and powerful can muster. Mm -hmm. So it's like you're trying to pretty much bridge the gap on the whole thing. And what was that one moment that simply inspired you to uh, to help the poor and the less fortunate in terms of um, the, the legal system and everything? And one first inspired you to uh, to become a lawyer? Yeah, that's an interesting story. So when I was about 10 years old, my family moved um from Virginia up to Massachusetts. And one of my family members was falsely accused of assault and battery of a police officer, which is a felony. Um, and while these charges were pending, he lost his security clearance, which pretty much ended his career. And um, I was a child, I mean, I was 10 years old. I didn't really understand what was going on, but I did understand the fear 
and the confusion and the bewilderment. I, and my parents had to take a second mortgage out on the house to pay for a lawyer. It was an incredible financial strain, professional strain, reputational strain. Um, we went to trial um, and won an acquittal, uh, but it took a year and it was really dramatic and traumatic. And I think it was at that time I decided I was going to be a lawyer. Hmm. Um, I wanted to help people who found themselves in that situation. And I think as important, I did not want to be on the receiving end of a process I didn't understand. Hmm. I wanted to, I wanted to under, I mean, the government scared me. I became afraid of government at that point. And I wanted to understand it and be able to protect myself and protect people I love mm -hmm. from the government. Mm -hmm. yeah. you, you also talk about the uh, Nez, per Nez Perce uh, tribe as well, too. If you were a lawyer back in the day of the uh, Nez Perce war and everything else, what would you have done? That's an, that's an interesting question. Um, if you look, well, the, the, the law was overtly discriminatory at the time, uh, w w which is stunning in retrospect because we had just fought a civil war and passed constitutional amendment guaranteeing equal protection of the laws. Mm -hmm. But it would be almost a hundred years before the Supreme Court interpreted that language to mean something other than separate, but supposedly equal. Mm -hmm. um, but it seemed clear, I mean, as a lawyer, it seems clear to me that the Nez Perce were being denied the equal protection of the law. Um, but at the time they were not considered American citizens. Native Americans were not considered American citizens. And at the time, it wasn't clear whether they had any constitutional rights. The um, Indian Civil Rights Act wasn't passed until the 1960s, clarifying that question. So um, today, what happened to them would be clearly illegal. But at the time, uh, the law allowed overt discrimination against Native Americans. There wasn't a lot that could be done without some political will to protect these populations. And, and, and what percentage of the uh, Nez Perez's, uh, Nez Perez's uh, left? What percentage is left? So um, the Nez Perez were, are scattered. Today they're scattered. Um, there are some of them in Idaho, on the reservation in Idaho. There still is a Nez Perce diaspora in Canada. Um, some of the Nez Perce surrendered at the conclusion of the war. They were sent first to Leavenworth, Kansas. And um, years later, they were sent back to the Pacific Northwest. Those who agreed to become Christians went to Idaho. Those who wanted to continue with their own tradition were sent to uh, Washington state. So they're really, and of course, as you know, many Native Americans have left um, their assigned reservations in the 150 years since the war. So um, the Nez Perce people are really scattered. They do have an event once a year called Chief Joseph Days in Joseph, Oregon, named mm -hmm. after Chief Joseph. And, um, and Nez Perce from all over the country uh, and the world gather there and reconnect. So it's quite beautiful to see. You also talk about the story too, that some of the Nez Perce uh, also, um, you know, fled to Canada as well too, in, in the book, uh, Bone Neck. So you mean, tell us um, a bit about that. What was their trek like trying to um, sneak over to Canada and try to get um, what immigration or immunization uh, status or protection from the Canadian government? Yeah, this is a fascinating story. And you mentioned earlier the Battle of the Little Bighorn and um, uh, Sitting Bull. That was in 1876, the year before the Nez Perce War. And uh, at the time of the Nez Perce War, Sitting Bull was in Canada with about a thousand Lakota Sioux who had also received political asylum. 
Hmm. And uh, the Nez Perce who escaped joined Sitting Bull. They wow. spent that first winter of 1877, 78. They arrived in terrible condition, freezing, cold, exhausted, on foot for the most part, wearing rags uh, with nothing. And Sitting Bull took care of them, although the uh, Lakota and the Nez Perce had not been traditional allies. They used to fight over hunting grounds, but Sitting Bull took them in, took care of them that winter, and then um, the Nez Perce, once they regained their strength, kind of went their own ways. Um, but what happened is the Nez Perce, uh, after the incident I mentioned in which the young man named Walidus went hunt looking for the man who had murdered his father, um, a number of militias were formed and organized under the leadership of the military. And they hunted down the Nez Perce and what what ensued was an 1100 mile running retreat uh, punctuated by battles in various places including the big hole which i mentioned mm -hmm. so today there is a national park um, known as the nez Perce national historic trail and it is this 1100 mile trail um, from oregon through idaho montana down to wyoming then back up through montana ending in the Bear Paw Battle, uh, Bear Paw Mountains. What happened is that um, Crow Indians who were connected um, with the military captured the Nez Perce horses. And without horses, they couldn't move um, children, elders, sick people, injured people, the last 30 miles to Canada. Wow. So, uh, they were forced to divide into two groups. There were two surviving chiefs at the time. Chief Joseph uh, stayed behind with those who couldn't travel on foot the last 30 miles. He really sacrificed himself for those uh, 417 people. And uh, Chief Whitebird led the ones who were able to travel that final distance on foot to Canada. And um, interestingly, Joseph sent his wife and daughter, who was 14 years old at the time, he sent his wife and daughter to Canada with Sitting Bull and never saw them again. Mm. He was never allowed to see them again. But um, so, so White Bird um, took the able-bodied with him and they escaped. And Joseph stayed behind and surrendered on behalf of those who couldn't travel or who were unwilling to leave, family members who couldn't travel. Um, and he stayed with them and took care of them. He really sacrificed himself for them. That is so amazing what they did. Ultimate sacrifice, ultimate love and everything. And what, what do you want uh, readers to uh, get out of the book? Well, I would, like I said, I, the things I love about the story are sort of the rise of an unexpected leader. Chief Joseph became known as the Red Napoleon, which surprised nobody more than Joseph himself. He had never been considered a military leader by his own people, and he would have done anything to avoid the war that made him famous. So that sort of development of Joseph from the diplomat to the warrior is a really fascinating character arc. Um, I love the unexpected ending, um, how White Bird manages to escape with a good portion of the tribe and live in peace in Canada. And I love the um, pieces of the story that continue to have some relevance to us today. For example, um, I, I think Hollywood is too often presented Native Americans as besotted brutes which they were not. Um, I think uh, history books too often portray Native American history as a tragedy, as if there was something inherently flawed in their, in their personality or culture that doomed them to destruction. I think that's also a lie. It um, places the moral blame on the victim um, classically. And uh, it invites us to question 
um, whether we tell ourselves similar stories today. Uh, but maybe one of the things I love best about this story is around the same time I finished it, in December 2020, the Nez Perce managed to purchase 148 acres in Wallawa Valley, Oregon, their ancestral home. Nice. And uh, they had a parade. They invited everyone to come participate. They rode their horses down Main Street and they took possession of a piece of their traditional land where their people had lived for over 10,000 years. They were evicted for 148 years and then they were back. And I felt like that story was so inspirational for refugees everywhere who just want to go home. And, uh, and they did it. They finally did it. So um, I think it's a sad story in many ways, but it's also inspirational. And definitely inspirational indeed. And where can we find the book uh, Bone Necklace at? Uh, the book is available pretty much anywhere books are sold. You can buy it on Amazon.com. There's an audio book available on Audible. It's at Barnes and Noble and lots of other places. Amazon's probably the easiest place to buy it, though. Well, there's an ebook. Um, there's an audio book, and there's also a paperback and a hardback. We'll certainly check that out. What's coming up for Julius Selden of uh, Bone Necklace? We'll find out in just one minute. You listen to the Mike Widener Show at the MikeWidenerShow.com, powered by Sonic Web Studios. Visit online at SonicWebStudios.com for all your needs. Also brought to you by our official sponsor, the Mike Widener Show, International War Ring author, Mia Molson's The Missing, available on Amazon and paperback and ebook. We'll be back with the author of Bone Necklace, Julius Sullivan, after this time. We're back with author Julia Selvin of Bone Necklace here on the Mike Wagner Show. Talks about her experience as a lawyer in the U.S. and a solicitor in England and Wales for the poor and less fortunate. An amazing story about, um, you know, going on a trip uh, 20 plus years ago to Big Hole Battlefield in um, Wisdom, Montana, about the Nez Perce War and everything else. And um, what's coming up for you uh, or what can you expect from me in 2022 and beyond, Julia? Well, that's a great question. I had so much fun working on this book. I loved the whole process. I loved the research. I loved learning how to write fiction, which was a big job for me. Um, mm -hmm. I loved the creative process. I really enjoyed talking to people about the book. So I think I'm going to write another one. Um, and I, I have a couple of ideas I've started. So yeah, I'm going to get back to writing. And stay tuned for that too with Julia Sullivan. Who do you consider biggest influence in your career? In my career, well, I would, that's a tough one. As a writer, I think I'd probably have to say Larry McMurtry. One of my favorite books of all time is Lonesome Dove. I love the series. I love the grand landscapes. I love the sweep of history. I love the characters. I loved his, um, the way he used language and words. Um, so yeah, he's probably one of my favorite writers. And certainly is. And what's the best advice you can give to anybody at this point? At this point, I would, I think I would quote Chief Joseph, who, uh, who said, be brave and tell the truth. I like that. Very truthful indeed. Once again, author Julia Sullivan of Bone Necklace here on the Mike Widener Show. Julia, very big thank you for your time. You've been absolutely fantastic. Learned a lot from you. Looking forward to having you again soon. Make sure you keep us up to date. Keep in touch. Love to have you back. Once again, tell us about your upcoming projects. What's your website? How do people contact you? Where can people purchase or check out your book? My website is www.juliasullivanauthor.com and it has all my social media links. We will certainly do that. Once again, Julia, very big thank you for your time. You've been totally amazing. Learned a lot. Looking forward to having you again soon. Make sure you keep us up to date. Keep in touch. Let have you back. We wish you all best, and you've got a great future ahead of you. Thanks so much, Mike.